Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kim Janey. I'm a Boston City Councilor representing District 7. I'm the chair of the Small Business and Consumer Affairs uh, Committee. I am joined this afternoon by my colleagues, Anissa Asabi George, who is the sponsor of this hearing order, and Ed Flynn to my right. I want to remind you that this is a public hearing and that it's being recorded. Uh, please silence all of your cell phones and devices. We will take uh, public testimony after we hear from a panel and have some questions and answers. We ask that people state that their name, their address, and their affiliation. Um, you can also submit written testimony. Um, before we begin with our panel, I'll just say a few words and uh, invite the sponsor to say a few words and, and uh, Councillor Flynn to say a few words. So um, first, I want to thank uh, Councilor Sabi George for calling this hearing. I also want to thank uh, Councilor Flynn for being here, our panel for being here, all those who are attending. I want to especially thank Mass Senior Action for your advocacy on, on behalf of seniors, the Elderly Commission for your work to support seniors in Boston. I want to uh, thank and acknowledge uh, Attorney General Mara Healy for all of her work to protect consumers uh, and everyone who's here. Uh, as chair of this committee, you know, it's important that we pr uh, promote small business, but we also have to promote equity and protection for consumers. Um, too often we hear of seniors uh, being targeted for different scams, uh, whether it's telemarketing, whether it's through real estate. Um, and so we've got to do all that we can to make sure that this uh, community is being protected. Um, so again, I look forward to a uh, very productive conversation, and um, I'm glad that we're having this conversation, and I'll turn it over to Councillor Sabi George. Thank you, Councillor Janey, for uh, chairing today, and to all of our panelists who are here with us now and will be with us shortly. Last year, I filed this hearing order to hold uh, a conversation on elder scamming in hopes to bring an issue that occurs more often than not to the forefront. Financial fraud is the fi fastest growing form of elder abuse and concerns uh, when someone exploits an individual through deception involving financial transactions. Senior and elder abuse is vastly underreported, where only one in 44 cases of financial abuse is ever reported. This hearing order was originally inspired by Jamal Crawford, a concerned constituent regarding his experience with his grandmother, who was being harassed daily by people trying to buy her home and sell her bad insurance. This is an issue my staff and I hear about often when we are in civic meetings and in conversations with seniors across the city of Boston. It is also important to me that as we continue to become more informed of the resources that we're able to empower seniors with the tools they need to protect themselves. According to Boston's 2030 Age-Friendly Boston Action Plan, the city has approximately 125,000 residents that are 60 and above. As a city and as a state, we all believe seniors have the right to age in place, free from harassment. This is why I spent this last year making visits to senior centers, elderly homes and groups, to have listening sessions and to hear about the different types of scams, scams they have experienced the most. I've heard stories about predatory real estate buyers, financial scams like impersonating the IRS, uh, grandparents being uh, telemarketed, and robocalls and sweepstake schemes, door-to-door -door uh, sales, as well as identity theft. According to the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, between 2013 and 2017, scammers impersonating IRS officials have targeted more than 2.1 million taxpayers, and more than 12,000 victims reported losing more than $60 million from that form of a uh, scam alone. The reality is we have no idea the economic impact elder fraud has had. Most analysts go with the 2010 Investor Protection Trust Elder Fraud Survey in which they say one in five Americans over the age of 65 has been victimized by fraud. And a 2011 MetLife Mature Market Institute study determined that financial exploitation costs seniors at least $2.9 billion annually. However, according to another survey, companies that sell products 
in services to protect older Americans from, from financial abuse and exploitation, experts that financial elder abuse actually costs $36 billion annually, more than 12 times the earlier study's figure. Regardless, the prevalence of scammers that are exploiting our seniors is common, and the economic implications are significant. In fact, through some of our conversations across the city, many, many of the seniors would sort of chuckle over the experiences and the phone calls and the mail that they would receive, the conversations that they'd get trapped into. But I often, and they chuckled about being able to outsmart them, um, where some, uh, some of the other seniors in any of those rooms often sat silent, and I wondered what, what shame they might have fe felt or what stigma they may feel for being caught up in a scam, and it's certainly not not their fault, especially as more and more of our seniors live in isolation and live at home. Um, during today's hearing, I hope that our panelists that are doing this work every day can help offer guidance on what can be done to protect our seniors from, from falling victim to any fraud. I'd like to bring back what we learned today uh, to our seniors and do that in partnership with my colleagues who are here today, creating, and we could work together to create greater awareness of the problem, making sure that our seniors are aware of their rights and are more aware of the different resources available to them. And as we as a council continue our work, uh, that we include this as we discuss policy issues focusing on a multitude of issues, but that we're focused on those that are vulnerable and those that often find themselves isolated from support. I thank you all for being here. I thank you for the work that you've been doing through your different capacities um, and look forward to hearing from you during today's hearing. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Janey. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Flynn. Thank you, Councilor Janey, for your leadership on this important issue and to Councilor Anissa Sabi george for your, your leadership on this issue as well, for calling this hearing, uh, for bringing together experts um, in trying to help as many seniors um, in our city as we can. Um, I wanna say thank you to the Mass Senior Action, the Attorney General's Office for her great work on helping our elderly uh, for so many years and especially the elderly commission here at the City of Boston we see them at so many public events um, trying to help the elderly with needed services. Uh, they're always there for our residents. So we're proud of the elderly commission, the great work they've been doing in this city for, for so many years. And um, one of the reasons I'm so interested in this topic is in my district, I see a lot of exploitation of the elderly in terms of their, their homes a lot of real estate people or um, those that know the elderly can be exploited are, are trying to take advantage of, of them um, making offers on their property um, that are unfair, that are unreasonable, and then the resident would, would agree to it and then shortly thereafter the, the person that bought the house would, would flip it. So we're seeing a lot of that, that exploitation of the elderly in our city and um, you know it's not fair, and I'd like to see our laws strengthened. Um, and but more importantly, make sure that our elderly are aware of the services that are, that are available to them, and to provide PSAs, public service announcements, to help the elderly um, on on many of these issues. Again, I just want to say thank you to Councilor Janey, to a Council Councilor Anissa Sabi George as well for their great leadership on this important issue. Thank you. Thank you. Now uh, we'll hear remarks from our panelists and I will begin uh, to my far right with Melissa Carlson who's the Deputy Commissioner for the Boston Elderly Commission. If you could uh, introduce yourselves as you make your presentations that would be great. Thank you, Melissa. Wonderful. Um, I'm Melissa Carlson. I'm one of the Deputy Commissioners in the Elderly Commission. Thank you for having us here. Um, we are very excited to be here and offer our comments on scams affecting older adults. Organizations working with older adult populations have worked for decades to assist older adults to be more aware of scams in order to decrease the number of individuals who are defrauded every year. In the Commission on Affairs of the Elderly, we recognize the challenges older adults face as common targets of scams and have worked to inform and assist older adults when it comes to elder abuse and fraud. In the creation of our age-friendly action plan, 
which we launched in 2016, we included an action item around scams to enhance the safety of older adults through education. The action item states we will continue to collaborate with community partners who are experts on fraud, elder abuse, and financial exploitation to raise awareness, warning signs, and avenues for assistance. We will consider multiple methods, including the city's communication channels, local television, and community newspapers to spotlight these resources. So far, we have worked together to pull a committee of experts in elder abuse to meet monthly and discuss the best way to have a coordinated approach in tackling abuse of all kinds, including fraud and scams. This allows us to work with internal city departments and external partner agencies to make sure we are up to date on new scams and can work together on addressing them. In addition to our own committee and the work the Commission on the Affairs of the Elderly is a part of the Massachusetts Elder Identity Theft Coalition led by the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office, this coalition is heavily focused on preventing scams and fraud and has the primary goals to train service provider organizations, educate older adults, and raise awareness among businesses. This statewide outreach helps us to expand the reach of information and make sure we are up to date on the trends the Attorney General's Office has identified. We also recognize that the best way to help older adults around scams is to keep people informed so they can recognize them before they are defrauded. We have worked to spread awareness through a number of avenues, including our Boston Seniority Magazine, where we have published a series of articles outlining new and common scams people may come across. We have partnered with AARP, who have their own Fraud Watch, where they share scams on their social media platforms to their members. And we are always working with our staff and our partner organizations to spread the word when we hear of new scams. When we do work with older adults who have been scammed, we connect them with one of our advocates in our office who can assess the situation and then refer the constituent to the most appropriate place. Depending on the situation, we often make referrals to Greater Boston Legal Services, the Attorney General's Office, protective services, or the Boston Police Department. These groups can try to address the issue and identify the scammer and assist the elder. Through collaboration with partners, educating older adults and connecting with partners, staff, and constituents to resources, we hope to build awareness and have less people scammed in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to make a presentation? Yes, thank you. My name is Janice Fahey, and I am a legal analyst with the Consumer Advocacy and Response Division at the Office of Attorney General Maura Healy. Good morning, Councillor Janey and Councillor Asabi George. Thank you for inviting us here today. And good morning, Councillor Flynn. Our division, the Consumer Advocacy and Response Division, does several things. It works with consumers and businesses to help resolve disputes. In addition, we conduct outreach across the Commonwealth to address high volume and high priority consumer issues. We employ trained consumer specialists to address a wide range of consumer issues. In fiscal year 2017, the division and its community partners aided over 8,000 consumers. In my role, I oversee the work of vulnerable populations, including homeless, immigrant populations, veterans, and elders. We also maintain an elder hotline staffed by volunteers who can answer questions, resolve disputes with businesses, and assist with issues like elder exploitation, identity theft, scams, and persistent telemarketing calls. We greatly appreciate your time and attention to this matter and to help you to answer the important question of how do we better protect our senior residents from becoming victims of fraud. My goal today is to provide you with information for seniors and tell you about the resources within the Attorney General's office to educate older residents. To put this problem in context, 
A recent study estimated that $37 billion was stolen from older Americans through fraud, identity theft, and scams in 2017. Elders are sometimes targeted by unfair and business, deceptive business practices, scammers, and identity thieves. Some of the top identity theft categories in 2017 were credit card fraud, tax and government scams, bank account fraud, and utility scams. This is information from the Federal Trade Commission. And the average fraud loss was $429. For those over 70. Sorry, can you repeat that? How much? Sure, $429 in 2017. For those over 70, that number increases to $621, and by 80, over $1,000. On our elder hotline, there are several common scams that are reported. And although we may be familiar with these scams, we need to keep talking about them because we still get calls about these every day. One of the biggest scams is the grandparent scam, where someone will act as a, telling them that they have a grandchild either in custody, in jail, or maybe they've had a car accident, and they need to pay fees and costs uh, in order to get out of jail uh, or to uh, the clerk. And the person who's acting as a grandchild will often say, hi, Grandma. And many times, the grandparent will say, hi, Johnny. And there's the hook. Because then they have the name of the grandchild, and they will keep using that name in order to uh, exploit and get money out of the senior. Uh, and uh, we see it every day. I got a call a couple days ago about this happening. Uh, so it's something that we always have to keep aware of and keep telling the community about. Uh, utility scam. Someone calls and tells someone that their electricity or heat will be shut off unless they go out and purchase gift cards. And what the, the gift card is they have to purchase the gift cards, scratch the back of the gift card, and call back and give that number to the person so that their heat and hot water is not shut off. This scam involving gift cards has increased, and the use of gift cards has increased by over 100% this year over last year, according to the Federal Trade Commission, who keeps information at ftc.gov slash data that is specific to each state. Additionally, the national lottery scam has been a problem. Someone's told that they've won a national lottery and that they need to pay fees or taxes in order to get this money. They're, unfortunately, sometimes they're sent a check for, this, for these, this money and are asked to pay money from this check. So the money goes into their bank account. They pay the fees and taxes, which are really not fees and taxes because it's a scam. And then the check does not clear. So there's the, re the way that this happens is that uh, the banks are required to give money within a certain amount of time. So they have to make those funds available. However, if it's a fraud, two weeks later, the fraud department could let the person know that this money didn't clear and that they need to pay back this money. Additionally, there's a Medicaid cards are being issued right now, new Medicaid cards, Medicare, excuse me, Medicare cards, and that is so that the uh, social security number does not appear on the card any longer. However, scammers have taken advantage of this knowledge and tried to scam seniors by calling them and letting them know they need to verify the information. And that information, of course, is your social security number. Additionally, there's another scam where they say that they can provide you with a better card because the cards that come are kind of paper cards and they will provide you with a plastic card that's more durable for a fee. Luckily, because of all the work that people are doing around this state, 
Uh, I've heard last week we were at the Mass Council on Aging doing a presentation, and we heard from a lot of people that they're not getting as many calls about this because of the efforts that are be being made from all of the partners in this work. Another scam is the IRS scam, with someone complaint claiming to be from the IRS indicates that you owe taxes and that you will be arrested if you don't pay them now. So a lot of these take on uh, the role of an imposter scam where someone is pretending to be someone else. Uh, in your materials that you can look at after, uh, we've provided some materials on common scams as well as something that we would like to see every senior have above their phone to talk to them about uh, basic information on what to do if someone asks you certain questions. Most of the time it's if it's a telemarketer or someone who is asking you for money uh, it, if, in order to get money, hang up the phone. I can share some specific examples of things that we've been working on at the office. We recently assisted an elderly couple who were having money taken out of their checking account each month, and they claimed it wasn't authorized. They tried to call the company and tell them, we did not authorize this purchase. They were told that, yes, you signed up for a free trial offer. And because of that, there's small fine print in it that says, this will be a monthly charge unless you cancel this purchase. To make matters worse, the company said, we can't refund your money, and we can't stop the recurring charge. They contacted our office. We were able to stop the recurring charge, as well as to get a refund for this elderly couple. These types of free trials, sometimes it's beauty creams or other uh, personal care products, uh, is we, we try to encourage seniors not to go for the free trial offer because often this is a way for the either one, there's small fine print that requires you to keep paying for these items even if you don't want them. Two, sometimes they ask for personal identifying information and in that case, that information is out there and leaves you susceptible to identity theft. We've also seen headlines about consumers' personal information, such as names and social security numbers being stolen. Many will recall the Equifax breach, where about 145 million Americans, including 3 million people from Massachusetts, had their information hacked, probably many people in this room today. We were the first state to sue Equifax for failing to protect consumers' personal information. Our office continues to assist elders with identifying scams and walking them through the steps that take if they have had their identity stolen. And we get calls every day to assist people with this, identifying scams, talking them through what to do if they've been scammed, and talking them through what to do if they've had their identity stolen. Sometimes it's sophisticated com com computer hackers. In other cases, your personal information can be obtained through other measures such as sifting through your mail or trash or pretending to be a friend or relative over the phone. In some cases, scammers use technology known as spoofing to look like it's a call from a friend or the area code is the same as yours and the local code is the same as yours so you're more likely to pick up that call. Also, we still have door-to-door -door scammers that can pretend to be home improvement contractors, a magazine salesperson, charity solicitors asking for donations. We tell people to not open their door to people they don't know. Don't start conversations with strangers knocking on your door. And if you suspect a scam, call the police. This is an area where if you are, if there's a scammer in your neighborhood, the local police can be called and they can be there in a short amount of time to stop this person from scamming an elder or another neighbor. We also tell people if they're using their computer, never to click on links unless you've verified the sender. We've had a lot of people scammed by that, um, that think that the 
one of a technology company has told them that their antivirus software has um, uh, needs to be updated. And if you click on that, you've given the scammer access to your computer. You get a call about this, and those people uh, can take the personal information that you have on your computer once they have access to your computer. So we tell people always verify the person that sends them this information independently of any type of message and don't click on those pop-up messages. Some signs that you might be know that you're a victim of identity theft, you get bills from medical providers even though you did not receive medical care. You see withdrawals from your bank account you don't understand and we tell people to make sure they check their statements. You're contacted by debt collectors regarding unfamiliar debts or the IRS informs you that your tax return was filed using your personal information. Our office can explain how to file a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission, file a police report, and obtain a fraud alert or credit freeze. A new federal law requires the three major credit reporting companies, Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax, to provide free credit freezes. There's some materials about that in their folders today. Free credit freezes can be accessed by mail, phone, or over the internet. It's an excellent tool to prohibit people from opening new credit lines in your name. We also recommend that consumers diligently check their credit report. We always ask people when we do outreach, have you checked your credit report? When we started doing this around June, we only got a few hands. The last event we went to last week, almost everyone raised their hand. So these efforts do make a difference. And everyone's entitled to a free credit report. And if you get one of the three every four months, then you can get ones throughout the year. And it's easy to do. One thing to note, people will have to give their social security numbers to get this information. That was a barrier before we started talking to people about this. At home, some easy measures elders can use. Shredding. A lot of organizations have shredding events throughout the state. Never give out personal information, like credit card or social security numbers, over the phone or through text messages or by email. Don't use public computers, like the library, for financial transactions. And don't let other people make copies of your license or government identification cards. Ask that question. Why do you need this information? If you're tired of receiving these credit card offers in the mail, you can also opt out at optoutprescreen.com. That's O-P-T, opt out, O-U-T, prescreen, P-R-E-S-C-R-E-E-N.com. We've also undertaken a variety of measures to tackle this problem. Because our division saw an increase in the number of calls and complaints from elders, and an increase in the amount of money that was taken from elders, we've been fortunate to obtain a federal grant to establish the Massachusetts Elder Identity Theft Coalition. Lucky to have here today Ludmila Mignosa, who's the program coordinator for this coalition. We worked with the Department of Justice, Office of Victims of Crime, and the Identity Theft Resource Center to work on this National Identity Theft Victims Assistance Network. Today, 30 partner organizations have joined the coalition, and our goal is to improve the outreach and capacity of victim service programs and address the needs of victims of identity theft. Members include state agencies, law enforcement, legal aid organizations, local consumer programs, and banking organizations. The <clears throat> Commission on Affairs of the Elderly for the City of Boston is part of our coalition, as is the Massachusetts Healthy Aging Collaborative, as well as many other organizations that we partner with. We've held over 20 events since June, and what we do is train seniors, as well as, as advocacy organizations and organizations and coalition members. We go around the state and train elders to prevent scams and identity theft and to teach them what to do if they have become victims of identity theft. 
We also train advocates, as last week we were at the Mass Council on Aging, training councils on aging, as well as local consumer programs and other advocates on how to assist elders to be proactive in preventing their identity from being stolen, as well as what signs to look for that their identity has been stolen, and what to do to assist them after having, in the event that they're a, vi a victim of identity theft. We have trained over 1,000 elders and advocates in over 11 counties of the state. We also have a Savvy Seniors Guide, which is in your materials, that assists seniors to watch for scams and what to do after they sometimes are scammed or a victim of identity theft. My colleagues in CARD and regional offices and in the Community Engagement Division also travel around the state to continue to raise awareness of scams and identity theft. And uh, we also go to, uh, specifically to housing organizations so that we can get to people in every part of the state and even in their own homes. <clears throat> so my partner division also partners with other parts of the Attorney General's office. And uh, for example, in October, we sued a competitive electric electricity supplier. We allege that it deceived consumers by falsely promising to lower electricity rates and instead signed them up for expensive contracts and ultimately made them pay millions more on their bills. We also submitted comments to the federal government calling on telephone companies to take a more proactive role in addressing these annoying and pervasive robocalls. We also submitted public comments to assist elders when they take out a reverse mortgage and to protect spouses who may have still be in a home after a spouse dies when they have a reverse mortgage. So a few good tips. Uh, ask your telephone company about options for blocking robocalls uh, if it's a landline. And you can also just look for the apps for uh, robocall blocking. Sign up for the state federal do not call list. Make sure that you report scams to the Federal Trade Commission. If you get a robocall, just hang up. Don't engage with a scammer. Seniors can also call either our Consumer Advocacy and Response Division or our Elder Hotline or one of our many specialized hotlines within our office. That information is also in your packet. I'm also proud to say that my colleagues in my division the Consumer Advocacy and Response Division can speak eight languages. And we're fortunate to have staff in other parts of our office that are fluent in additional languages. Thus, our consumer team can ensure people for whom English may be the second language to access our resources. As I said before, I have brought some handouts and publications prepared by our office and other information that address many of our consumer issues I've raised today. I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you, and I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. And before we get to questions, I want to give you the opportunity if you wanted to present. Certainly. My name is Walter Laskos, and I am with the Cooperative Credit Union Association. Uh, it's a trade organization representing credit unions in the states of Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Delaware. Um, first of all, I want to applaud those who are sitting with me at the panel today for the, the actions they're taking on behalf of seniors. I think today's a great day for seniors in that we're raising awareness of the, uh, the actions being perpetrated against them by scammers and fraud, uh, fraudsters. Uh, you know, it was mentioned that the industry is, it's 34 billion really reported in losses for seniors in 2017. And one of the things we find is, and it's so sad, it's so sad when you think about it because a lot of seniors don't report the losses. They're embarrassed, they're ashamed. So it's a lot more than $34 billion that's lost. And you can imagine that given the fact that it's $34 billion industry, why these perpetrators continue to do what they do. They're specialists, they're experts at what they do of getting the money and experts at using the most sophisticated technology today and, and approaches to be able to scam the money from seniors. Well, you might ask and wonder why credit unions are involved when you look at uh, you know, 
organizations that are the Attorney General's office and, and also, uh, you know, uh, service providers for the elderly. And basically it comes down to the background of credit unions. Our business model is one that it's, it's a cooperative financial business model and it's built on principles and values. And, and one of those values really focuses on education and it's education of the members and education of the community. So about a year or so ago, uh, our board of directors decided to launch a national survey to get more information and data about uh, scams being perpetrated against the elders. And we got that survey back and the board itself was really alarmed at the results of what it saw, the data that, that came across. Uh, over two thirds of familiar caregivers, caretakers, report that their elder relatives had been targeted by a fraud or scam. So this is maybe about a 1,500 uh, population that were surveyed. Out of that group, over two thirds said that their elder relatives were targeted. 44% of those that were surveyed said that the elders do not have a plan in place if they fell victim to a scam. And 26% of all adults reported having their financial information hacked. We know about all the hacking that's going on. Um, and also something that was very interesting, uh, only 4% of elders have taken a financial literacy course over the last five years. And 39% of Americans report that their elders are not at all or only somewhat financially literate. So that prompted the credit unions to say we need to take some action. What the credit unions did is they worked with a, a firm out of Washington DC to create a software platform that really trains the users in recognizing the impact, recognizing I should say the signs of elder financial abuse and also knowing what to do in response. So we made that available to all the credit unions and the credit unions put their staff through it. And today we have more than 5,000 uh, frontline staff from our member credit unions have participated and been certified in this program so that they could really take action uh, to protect seniors when they, when they come into the, to the branches to withdraw money, to do things that kind of make one question if it's legit or not. And we didn't stop there. We also created a software version of this program called CU Senior Safeguard, CU for Credit Union. The version is placed on our website, bettervaluesbetterbanking.com. And on that website, this free version is available to anyone in the community, any caregiver, any person that's dealing with the elders to, to go on and to become more familiar with the, uh, the signs of elder abuse and the resources available in the community. So in order to, to really emphasize that, that commitment of credit unions, we also engaged in a campaign to do a lot of radio spots in the four states we're in, and a number have already been airing here in Boston and out in Springfield and Worcester Market. Um, we've also been not only doing the radio commercials, but we're doing radio interviews, and, and we're, we're looking to continue to do those and, and work together with the Attorney General's office as well, because the more we could get in front of the community at large and raise awareness about this, uh, it will have an impact. And I'm happy to hear that in the work that's being done so far that more hands are going up now about folks that are checking their credit reports. So it proves that what we're doing here today has, has an impact, it can deliver results, and it could help educate our seniors and our caregivers about this, this dilemma that's facing them. And, and not only that, but when I, I was thought of when I was listening to the, the presentation so far, that we have to also be mindful of the fact that today in social media, so much is put out there in the public limelight. And that's where a lot of these fraudsters and scammers get a lot of information. Oh, Johnny is, I see here he's on vacation down in South Carolina and then you find out that the grandma says have a good time and next thing you know, the grandma's being called because hey, Johnny has been arrested and needs to be bailed out, uh, but don't, don't call the parents, don't, he does, he's embarrassed, so send money. Uh, you know, that kind of happens. Uh, so again, it's 
the, the message has to be through a lot of these programs that we're doing in the community to educate seniors about the resources and educate them with tips on how to remain safe. Um, what we're doing is we're hosting what we're calling Lunch and Learns, where we host an event at a senior center and we invite the other community leaders to come in and join with us. So we had, uh, I was at a, a meeting last night in Chicopee. We had the mayor of Chicopee with us. We had the chief of police with us. The district attorney was with us, uh, some caregivers. And we basically spent, we had a sellout crowd. We had more than 150 folks come for dinner and come to hear the presentation and to get some information about protecting themselves. Um, and it was a thorough success in that everyone from the community had a chance to tell them about the, tell the seniors about the resources that are available that they, and that they're free, that they could access to help protect themselves and also giving them tips on how to protect themselves. We're looking, credit unions are looking to continue to do that effort as we move into toward 2019 and beyond. This is a message that I believe has to be continually told over and over and I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity of being able to apply my voice today on behalf of a lot of seniors that don't have the voice to say, help us, uh, help us protect ourselves. Um, and the message, as I mentioned earlier, is verify for seniors. If you get a call, if, if uh, we, we also get, uh, the, the chief mentioned that it came up last night, where folks are saying that the police society is taking donations you know, for the officers. And just take a check and put it in your mailbox out in front and they'll come by and collect it. Well, you know, the, the police department is more than happy to, to accept a check down at the police station. And, but also, before you do anything, verify that this is actually legit or not, rather than just writing a check and putting it out in the mailbox where you know who's gonna come and take it. So that's also important, that verification. The education and the partnership is there. Credit unions of Massachusetts are putting our hands out, and, and it, this is good for me being here today because it also, solidifies a relationship with others that are looking to do the same as the credit unions, and that is bring our message in front of seniors, educate them, continually say the message over and over so that they hear us clearly of how to protect themselves and how not to do what leads to being scammed and losing thousands of dollars. Um, and I guess I would like to close with, with a message uh, that when you think about it today, I think we need to send a message to those who are scammers, those who are fraudsters, those who uh, we find a lot of times are relatives of our elders, family members who are looking to scam a loved one from their money. We're on to you. There are a lot of organizations taking action to protect seniors, to raise awareness and to do something. Now is not the time to scam elders and, and seniors because we're on to you. And thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you all for all of the work that you're doing. Um, I just have a, a few questions and then I wanna turn it over to um, our sponsor here for the, for the bulk of the questions and then we're gonna get to another uh, panel. So um, this is very frustrating to hear that people who are most vulnerable are being taken advantage of. And when I think about um, elders and seniors in our community being on fixed incomes to hear, you know, $429 or $621 or $1,000. I can't imagine, you know, being without $1,000 and what that's doing to someone on fixed income. I wonder, uh, it was mentioned, and we know that this is an undercount because people are not reporting because they're embarrassed. They're shame, they don't want to admit they've been taken advantage of, or perhaps they think nothing will come of it if I report it. So who knows what the, the real numbers are. I wonder if you could, you mentioned a lot of scams. We heard a lot of scams mentioned. Um, are some of those uh, more happening more frequently than others? And, and the methods in which people are getting to our seniors, is it more through calls? <coughs> is it more in person? Is it more like on the internet? Do we have a sense of how that pile is being divided in terms of that point of contact? Okay. So um, we get calls every day at our office about new scams and there's always a new scam. Uh, for example, we just recently started getting calls about uh, people saying that there's a new law uh, regarding signing up for health in your health insurance. 
and they're going to help you to sign up for your proper health insurance. So what we like to tell people is it's, there's always a new scam, but there are certain methods that are followed by scammers. So for example, all, many scams are just imposter scams. So the things we tell people are if they're asking you for money to get money, then that's probably a scam. Um, and uh, like with the grandparent scam, uh, whenever there's, there's a use of a, of a uh, card, for example, like the latest, we just learned from the Federal Trade Commission that the latest two uh, cards that are being used are um, Google Play and iTunes. Those are like the two major ones. So, so there's certain things that we can tell people that all of the scams follow. And by doing that, and uh, if you want to just take a look at that, uh, the handout that we gave you, it's called Over the Phone, mm -hmm. in order to help you to, um, to help elders right in their homes. And they can just look at this, this one um, material and, and know what to do. So, and so is there's always the, going to be a the point scam. of contact, though? Is it mostly someone calling on the phone mm -hmm. to a senior? Is it mostly someone showing up at their door? Or is it mostly an email that they received or perhaps they've clicked on something on the internet, or, or do we not have that information? Do we, do we know where that kind of point of contact is coming from when it comes to the scams? Like, is it mostly yeah. phone calls? I, I would say, based upon the experience we've had when we've been out at senior centers doing these presentations, is that it does cover the gamut from the emails to the phone calls to the in-person you know, visits at the front door. Um, but a majority, it seems, comes across by telephone. Mm -hmm. And I and I and basically the remarks that we get back from seniors when we hold the events is stop. How do we stop the calls? You know, obviously the you know the best thing is don't answer the phone. Let it go into the answering machine, and then you can see what it whether you want to talk or not or, or answer it. But it seems like that is the the number one gateway that folks are using. And I applaud efforts that I see that are being done to somehow address this, you know, with the Federal Trade Commission about the numbers. I mean, uh, these fraudsters have access to all these numbers that they could constantly rotate. I think steps are steps can be taken to at least provide some impediments to the, to, to the scammers that to, not to be able to have access the way they do right now to be able to constantly do these calls. But it seems like that's the, that's the primary source that we're hearing. Right, and it is all over. Like, I've gotten emails myself from people who, you know, you know, you recognize the name, okay. but the email address will be different. So if you don't check the email address and it's, you know, I'm away in a different country and well, I, I something happened and send money and... I, I get calls that are in Chinese from Los Angeles. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so if in fact someone's identity is stolen, how long, do we have a sense of how long it takes to really resolve that issue? Mm. Or, I assume it varies, but... Yes, it can vary. Um, it, 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 and it's not just like the financial effects. It does take an emotional toll on seniors as well. Uh, from what we've heard when we've worked with resident service coordinators, they've had people that have been very distraught at having their identity stolen. So what we try to do at our office is give people the steps that they can take to start to recover from identity theft and also to make sure we give them the resources and work together with other organizations throughout the state in order to, to have them resolve that identity theft problem. Um, uh, we can work with them on the steps and there are other organizations around the state that can help them with the legal part of the, like as far as um, if they have um, uh, an issue relating to, and they have legal needs, there's an organization in Massachusetts that can assist them with those legal needs that are associated with identity theft. Uh, but we also have spoken to someone um, who does something similar in another state, and she, she tells us that it can take up to a year. Um, but obviously, the, the other issue is that sometimes people can be re-victimized, so that's something to be uh, aware of as well. So if someone is vulnerable to one scam, there's a chance that they will be vulnerable to the next scam as well, or uh, identity theft issue. And then, um, do we have a sense of how many people, in terms of the scammers, are actually prosecuted, are, are caught and then prosecuted? Do we, I know there's no one here from representing police, but I just wondered if you have that data. Sure, I do know that there are things that are being done behind the scenes, and that there have been instances where 
um, the, for example, the Federal Trade Commission um, and other organizations and um, have been able to take down a scammer in another country and close down an entire building of people who were IRS scammers telling people that, they're, uh, that they owed money to the IRS. So things are being done in addition to the things that our office is doing about robocalls because uh, we know that prevention is really the key in this area. So yeah. the more we can do, the, the more people won't It's just be so scammed. upset, like I'm just so angry. To, I mean, can you imagine the fear that someone is feeling when the IRS is calling or someone pretending to be the IRS is calling to say mm -hmm. that they owe money or a debt collector or anything, that something's happened to some, one of your loved ones, send, send sure. money. It's just, it's outrageous. Again, um, I have a few more questions, but I do want to turn it over to the sponsor uh, and keep the hearing uh, moving. I really do appreciate the, the, the work that you're doing. Um, this is really important. Um, Councilor Sabi George. Thank you, uh, Councilor Janey. And I think this is the sheet that you, I'm yes. going to take a picture of it and we'll post it on social media. Um, I think it's the, just the just hang up the phone is probably the greatest advice because there's not only when you hang up the phone, you are not able to become a victim of a scam, but you're also not giving any additional information to verify the telephone number or you know who you are and who the phone number might be associated with it. With um, is there? So I know you've there's a number of telephone numbers that you've shared in this packet. You know we have the uh, Commission on Elderly Affairs as well as some other phone numbers. It, what is the easiest way when we're you know if we're gonna Many of our seniors across the city of Boston watch this uh, program right now, the hearing. I'm surprised sometimes how many people actually watch it. But what is the number? If I'm going to give one number now to be shared widely, what is that phone number? Now, are you talking about, can you give me some examples for like Well, we have a, a, if there is a senior at home watching now mm -hmm. and they feel that they've been victimized okay. in some way, um, in any of these ways, okay. what's the so most direct I think way we can tell them or the first, first spot to go? Sure. So it depends on the situation. If there's a scammer in your neighborhood, call the police, local police immediately. If you feel like you're at, in danger, call the police immediately, 911. Mm -hmm. um, to the extent that you want to know if something that, let's say you're talking to someone right now or you talked to someone this morning and they want you to call back and give them the numbers from a, the back of a card, first of all, please don't. Uh, it's probably a scam, or it, I'm guessing it is a scam. And uh, I think we've got to assume that it's yes. going to be a scam unless it's been verified or you've asked for this phone call. Exactly. So, so yeah, don't, if, if someone called you, don't give them money. Independently verify numbers and information. Uh, additionally, you can call our office. Uh, the, um, our Consumer Advocacy and Response Division has a hotline. And if you are worried that something is a scam, please let us know. We have people that will answer the phone and be happy to talk to you through this. I've had someone call me recently on the hotline and tell me they were thinking about giving this money for taxes and fees because they were sure they won a national lottery. So is this the hotline? Can we just say it for those who are watching? Is it the 617-727-8400 number? Yes. That's the number for the hotline. Right. So Thank you. So if, you're, if you're in the Repeat middle that. of a scam situation, please. 617-727-8400. Yes. Now, so um, additionally, go ahead. So the Federal Trade Commission also wants people to report these phone numbers, and you can just go to ftc.gov and report a scam phone number. They collect these numbers, and by doing that, we can stop a scam in a couple, few hours. Uh, oh. And they can, they can take down a phone number. Uh, our office can't do that. Um, we work with the, closely with the Federal Trade Commission to do this work. Great, thank you. And then, uh, Melissa, through the city, is there a way to loop in through 311? So many of our seniors know to call 311 to report a number of different things. I noticed on the app, I looked quickly earlier, that there isn't any, there's an other category which a senior could report something that way, but if they mm -hmm. were to call 311, what would happen to that phone call? Sure. So if a senior calls 311 and identifies themselves as an older adult, um, quite often they will come to our office, the phone calls will come to our office, and then the advocates that are community service advocates, as I noted earlier, they will try and assess the situation that the senior is going through 
and then guide them to the best resource possible. Is it to call the Attorney General's office? Is it to call Greater Boston Legal Services, um, Protective Services, or we'll guide them and help them through the process on the steps that they need to take. Great. So 311 is always the be uh, great local phone number to mm -hmm. call. Great, so I, I wanna make sure if they were to call 311 that there is information available to make those other connections because on yep. the on the one and a half pager from the Attorney General's office, there's lots of different phone numbers for different reasons, so they'll be connected. How many advocates do you have in the office? We have eight, eight community service advocates that cover all of the neighborhoods. And are, are there language, um, yes. a variety of languages yep. also we offered? we have language capacity, and Great. then we also have access to the language hotline if someone speaks or is more comfortable speaking a language that we don't personally have. Right. And is that also the same in the Attorney General's office through any of these hotlines, a language capacity? Yes, that's correct. We have, like I said, I, we have over eight languages spoken in our division and uh, many more throughout our organization so that everyone can access our uh, consumer services. Great, thank you. And then, you know, one of the things that we talk, I mentioned in my opening statements, and I think that we will we'll all agree on, is the concern around any of our older adults or anyone that's been scammed, regardless of age, that is feeling ashamed of being of of being taken advantage of, of allow, you know, allowing this to happen. Although we know that the scam scam artists are called artists for a reason; they're very creative in how they get their work done. What, what are the things that we can do other than sharing information, um, expressing our desire for people to come forward and to ask for help? What are some of the other things that we could do? I don't know, through, I think it's great that you've got so mm -hmm. many bank employees trained to see, foresee some of these uh, challenges, but can we talk a little bit about that and the stigma that's attached with this? Yeah. I, it's, it's surprising because I think that whole issue of embarrassment is something that holds back a lot of seniors from from taking action mm -hmm. you know um, what, what we find that uh, when I when I talk to seniors on, on this particular subject you know I, I kind of bring up the fact that all of us one time or another in our life have maybe given five dollars or ten dollars to somebody that came up because they need a meal and next thing you know they take the money and they run off and go to the liquor store right. you know so we, we all have been taken advantage of somewhere along our lines. There's nothing to be embarrassed about if you're a senior and someone who is an expert at this gets you to write a check for $100 or $1,000 or whatever. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. Uh, you know, if anything, share it. Come forward, report it to the police immediately or another loved one, or a credit union that would be very helpful to, to try and guide you and send you in the, in the, in the uh, correct direction, because then you're preventing it from occurring to someone else. And I think the more that we could, we could encourage that, I think it's important. The other thing, too, that came across was that, um, you know, my, my wife's grandmother is like 92, 93 years old. She lives in a senior home by herself. She gets a call, and she engages with this person on a daily basis. But she's smart. She knows how to deal with this, and she's not going to let the scammer. But she's lonely, and she's looking for someone to talk to. We get a lot of seniors that are living by themselves, and they're lonely. So I think, you know, when, when I think of, you know, the mayor, and his call on how many occasions for the community to come together and care for one another. I think it's so important that we as a community come together and if we know of someone who's elderly and living by themselves, that we call on them from time to time, visit them, so that they're not so lonely, so that they don't resort to taking phone calls from scammers and you know, engage with them because these people are professionals and they will over, they have plenty of patience, Six months, seven months later, they'll wear you down and they'll get some information from you that they'll be able to take their money. So it, it's so important that I think we continue our efforts. I think that's, um, that's great advice. And uh, important, I think, for us to remember, especially any, you know, any one of us that have a relationship with someone who is maybe isolated or living alone, mm -hmm. that we are reaching out so that they're having safe conversations on the telephone or in person. What about training um, in any of our facilities, and this is for any of you, uh, but support and training for any of our senior, whether it's housing or nursing homes or places where 
larger groups of seniors might be. Education for staff to be aware, because sometimes the fraud is with a family member. Um, mm -hmm. I think too often the fraud is with a family sure. member, someone known to, to, our, um, to an older resident. But then also sometimes the fraud happens with the caregiver of that facility. What, what sort of education or resources are we providing places where seniors are um, often? So um, with our Massachusetts Elder Identity Theft Coalition, one of our goals is to train advocates to assist elders. So one of the things we teach them is certain signs to watch out for that someone might have be being financially exploited. Uh, like if they recently changed their power of attorney or uh, maybe they're starting to g uh, go to the bank and take out money uh, and don't have money for things. Like uh, they used to come for the coffees, but they don't seem to have those funds available. Or they just seem confused about things like, why am I giving this person money? And those are some of the signs that we teach them. So we've been lucky to get to resident service coordinators throughout the state in order to give them this training. So who are resident service signs. coordinators? Do you mind just? Sure, no problem. So uh, people who work in buildings with elders, and sometimes it's public housing, sometimes it's not, uh, who are there to assist the residents with um, different things like paperwork or how to, to go out and do certain, have certain services. Uh, so they're in the buildings, and they work directly with elders in order to um, assist them with, with just day-to-day -day living issues. And then what about um, any training for home health aides, especially ones that work with older adults? We've also gone out to protective services. We worked um, recently had an event at uh, Worcester uh, where we trained protective services um, on how to watch for signs as well, and as well as scams, and what to do if you see an elder who may have had their victim their, their identity stolen. So we're also get, trying to get out to all different parts of the state to train these protective services workers. Um, as far as um, people who are in people's homes for health care, um, our office is very aware that we want elders to, to age in place. And uh, we want to make sure that the people who go into their homes are going to be doing the, the work that they, that they are paid to be doing. And so, so we're very cognizant of, of um, making sure that the, those people are aware as well, so. Great, thank you. And Councillor Asabi, I might add too, the resource that credit unions have, uh, CU Senior Safeguard, that's freely available on the website, bettervaluesbetterbanking.com, is geared in a way for, for anyone, any caregiver in any circumstance, uh, to gain more uh, knowledge and uh, familiarity with the, the signs of, of scamming and fraud and, of course, the resources that are available from in the community. Great. I look, I look forward. Thank you, um, everyone, for sharing your information today. I look forward to bringing this as, um, as an at-large counselor, as a district counselor. We spend a lot of time in our communities, in our neighborhoods, at different meetings. So I look forward to sharing um, a lot of what I've learned today and over the last few months with all of our residents, because I think it's important, again, for everyone to have this awareness and knowledge. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Just a, a couple more questions. Um, we talked earlier about email or internet, in person. We talked about phone. What about mail? I know some residents, particularly uh, older homeowners, are getting uh, checks in the mail, you know, for $35,000, 40000 and perhaps it is not a scam and legitimate, but certainly not perhaps the wisest decision and you're putting your home in jeopardy. Uh, can you speak to uh, whether or not you're seeing people falling prey to those checks that come in the mail um, or not? Yes, we definitely do see this and that's why one of the things we recommended is the opt out because that will stop you from getting some of the things that might otherwise come that are legitimate. However, there are scams out there as well. And we do get information from the U.S. Postal Inspection Service at our office. They will from time to time let us know of a scam that's going on through the mail. And um, we make sure that we're aware of those scams and that we're making sure that we, t we teach <coughs> elders about what scams are out there. Right. But yes, if you get a check in the mail, sometimes uh, a check in the mail could be look like it's from your bank. You probably can answer questions about this more than I can. 
Um, or it could look like a, a government agency. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it will just be a little bit off. We get calls and we're happy to take calls about this, this question if someone has a question about whether something's legitimate. But the rule as before is always independently verify where did this come from. Don't use the number on the flyer or the mail. And uh, make sure that it is from the person who it says it's from because there are those scams out there and we continue to get those scams. If you were to cash one of those checks, then um, you can end up being in a, in a harder situation. Yeah, I'll probably right. let you talk a little bit that's more right. about that. That's right. I think it's also very important that in those circumstances, if, if you get something in the mail and it's, it's like, say, from a utility and it's fraudulent, whatever it could be, is not to call back at the phone number that's on that letter or on that uh, postage that, that's coming to you because that's fraudulent as well. Call back, go and get the actual number of the agency and call back and verify there. But again, it's always that constant verification that, that's needed in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. That, that's, that's really helpful. I'm going to ask one more. Yep. That's, go ahead. My, um, what about when uh, someone receives what's a legitimate check and it's to purchase the home and the senior may or may not fully understand how how impactful it is if they did cash that check or um, bring it to their bank and then all of a sudden they've entered into some sort of contract to sell their home, um, whether it's immediately or in the future. Well, in that case, if it's a scammer, please call our office immediately because mm -hmm. um, we, will, we are very cognizant of unfair and deceptive business practices, and we will walk anyone through the steps that it takes or refer them to the proper authorities or uh, legal counsel in that case. Okay. So My, uh, go ahead. just one more thing I want to make sure that I mention today is if you do suspect any type of elder abuse, and financial abuse is elder abuse, just make sure um, that you that are aware that the Executive Office of Elder Affairs has an elder abuse hotline. And that phone number is 800-922-2275. Thank you. Yep. And I think, you know, as you've mentioned, always verify the source, the information. Uh, my grandfather used to say there's no such thing as a free lunch. So no one's sending you a check for $40,000. It's just, it's without strings attached. And so important to uh, remember that. Um, again, I want to thank you for your work. It's very important work. And we need to all be getting this information out uh, for our elders, for our seniors, to make sure that they don't fall prey to uh, people who are taking advantage and are looking to hurt them. Um, I'm going to invite the next panel, certainly invite you to stay if you're able to hear from the next panel. Um, but now we will have uh, coming uh, Awilda Medina from Mission Hill, Eleanor Lovejoy from Dorchester, and Barbara Defoe from Roxbury. Thank you again. Thank you. You can make your way to the, the seats here. Well, welcome and thank you for being here. Uh, we can just go down the line uh, for presentation, if that's okay. If you could introduce yourself for the record. I don't know if someone, if who wants my, to begin? My name is Eleanor Lovejoy. I live at Keystone in Dorchester. Thank, thank you. you for being here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nervous? <laughs> no, don't be nervous. You Good afternoon. Anymore. My name is Awilda Medina and I live in Mission May. Hi, I'm Barbara Defoe. I live in uh, Grove Hall section of Dorchester. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. And do you have presentations to make? Um, Would you like to talk about your own experience or the work um, that you're doing? Well, I did have a couple of experiences. One was that somebody called and told me the payment on my car was six months overdue and they were going to repossess it. Thing is, I never owned a car. Um, there was another one the IRS had called 
or someone from the IRS saying that the cops were going to come and get me because I didn't pay my taxes. I immediately just hung up the phone because I knew that one was a scam. But other than that, you know, basically just the calls that come through, if I don't know the number, I take and don't answer it. But there was one thing my son told me. He said, Mommy, even if it has a 617 number and you're not sure of it, if you pick up the phone, wait and see if somebody says something. If they say Eleanor, don't answer at all. Just say, hmm, because the minute you say yes or whatever, they've got you going. So that was that. <laughs> Very good advice. Uh huh. Good advice. Now, do you uh, are you able to kind of share that information with others in your neighborhood? I've shared it with the ladies in my building, the right. seniors in my building. I've told them from time to time, and I've t explained it to the resident coordinator of our building, and she had said, you know, that they were gonna, they were trying that if it happened again to call the police station, you know, and give them the number that they had called from, and but I. Didn't get it anymore, thank God. <laughs> Ms. Medina, do you want to present? Yes, um, usually I do a lot of rounds. I visit elderly people. Some they are friends of mine. But last Tuesday, uh, I usually I visited a person in the hospital I used to work. But she, she was on vacation. I said, oh, well, I'm going to do something different. So I take the train all the way to JP, so I was gonna look for something that I need, window shopping, but uh, somebody was on the car and she went the horn and I said, oh, that was my godmother. And she told me that what happens to her, that she has to go to the bank because somebody was calling her <laughs> to make a, a money order, to go to stopping show to buy a green car with uh, the green card, she told me they cost 495 When she uh, asked her where I'm gonna send the money, the person say, uh, make a, a personal money order. So that's when she wake up and she went to the bank and canceled her account number. And when I was in her house, somebody called, I picked out the phone, and they say, this is so and so. Uh, we're still waiting for the amount. And then I hang up on the person. Wow. So she can mm. sell all her account. The one from Bank of America and the credit union in San Huntington. So from there, nothing happened. I'm glad you were able to intervene. Um, is it Mr. Fo? Yes. Yes, would you like to present? Yes. Um, thanks for having us. I, well, I'm trying to think, where do I start? Mm -hmm. I have gotten the IRS calls, and um, I remembered a couple of times, I was very nervous, of course, when you get these calls because you don't know what to do, and you get very excited. So I shared it with my children, and then I decided that, um, well, I need to find out more about it. So I, the person says that, well, if you don't pay, you know, the IRS is going to come after you, and, you know, um, uh, something to the fact that, you know, have mercy on your soul, or something to that effect. And so I was able to call the IRS, and they told me that they don't make phone calls, you know, to people who owe things, and that um, it was probably a scam. And so they gave me a telephone number and asked me if I get the call again, you know, to call them and give them the number that I got the call from. And so I did that a couple of times. And it's, uh, unfortunately, they, 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 ca they call from one number, then they change and get a different number and call you again. But I was able to take those two numbers that I had gotten, and I called the IRS and I gave them the number. They never said anything back to me, so I don't know what they did with it, but you know, I don't get those calls as frequently as, as I had been before. The other thing is that um, I remember getting on my iPad um, charges saying that I had ordered something and that um, I needed to click on this PDF file 
And because I'm not that much computer savvy, I'm afraid to click on to things. <laughs> so I did not click on, but I keep getting them. And so what I did was I called Apple customer service and I explained to them what was happening. So they gave me a number, to, uh, not a number, they gave me an email address. <coughs> so when I called, when I, when I get them, I think it's called Apple Phishing or something that, like that. And so from now on, well, since then, I've sent them several. What I do is I take the, the email that they send to me and then I uh, forward it to them at Apple Phishing. And they still keep coming, so I don't know whether or not they've been able to resolve it or not, but that's what I've been doing with, with that. I also get calls from Eversource saying that they're going to re they can reduce my rates, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm always afraid of that when they talk about reducing something. Everybody's out to make money, so I was just wondering how is it that they're going to reduce my rates, but I never, you know, engage in trying to find out about that. But so most of the times I'll just hang up or um, let them leave a message message on my answer machine. Another thing that, that I've gotten is that um, uh, FedEx. Recently, I've been getting emails from Fe something called Fe FedEx that my package, they weren't able to deliver my package. Well, I don't order anything through FedEx, so I don't know why, you know, I would get something from them. And there's always something that you click on or some other site that you're supposed to go to and I guess give you information and whatnot. So basically, I've just been ignoring those. Um, but I'm, I'm concerned, you know, that they will find different ways to get you. I've even gotten calls from people and they have my own telephone number, you know, so I, didn't, I don't answer those. I said, I'm not calling myself, so I know it's not mine. It's happened to it, me too. No. Yeah, well, just, I, but I don't, I've never answered, so I don't know who's on the other side of the line, because I said, I'm not calling myself, so why, why is my phone calling me? You know, so I don't answer those. Um, the other thing is that um, oh, recently, and I haven't had a chance to check that one out, I've gotten an email from Bank of America, and Bank of America, they're telling me that someone was trying to get into my account, my online account. I don't have an online account at Bank of America. I do have an, you know, an account there, but not online. I don't do anything online as far as finances is concerned because I don't know how to do it basically and I don't trust it you know so if I have anything to do I let my daughter take care of that for me so those are the things that have been you know coming in and so I just concerned but one other thing that that bothers me and someone mentioned earlier about family and I have a friend um, whose family scammed them out of three thousand dollars she definitely could not afford it she found out who took money out of her account and because it was a family member she doesn't want to do anything about it. I told her, you know, what you need to do is call the police and, you know, and have them arrested. But because it's a family member, this person has gotten, you know, gotten away with that. And it's so unfortunate that, you know, we are at the point where we can become enablers for people and even in our families, you know, to, to, scam, to scam other other people. And so what um, I also, sorry to say, but, Sometimes people will come by your house or they may clean your yard or they do something and then they knock on your door and want you to pay for it. You know, to me that's a shakedown or a scam. And so those are things too I think seniors need to be aware of. You know, that um, when people can do work for you then you, because you're an honest person, you think the person is doing you a good favor, that you know, okay, well we'll pay them. But then if they keep coming back, then that becomes a, that becomes a problem. So I think we need to understand and know how to do something about that. Um, the other, the last thing is that um, when when people call now, more, more than likely, I will pick up the phone and not say anything, so they will hang up. Or other times I'll leave, let the phone ring, and then it'll go to voicemail. Or sometimes if they don't get an answer, they'll just hang up. So I think the best thing to do is to not answer at all, you know, so that they, they, there's no connection with with the person who's on the other end who's trying to scam someone. Um, and and um, I'm, I really appreciate the fact that you are trying to do something about it because there's so many people who have been victims uh, of scams, whether it be a family member or someone from the country or out of the country. And thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. Well, thank you so much. That was a very thorough presentation. I really appreciate you all sharing uh, your personal stories. You know, I've my. My phone, my house phone, 
has called my house. Like, I don't know how that works. I worry about my mom, who is super nice and engaging and, you know, may want to talk to someone. Um, and so it's really important that we all know uh, these strategies and that we have the information that we need uh, to resist, you know, falling prey to that or, you know, knowing what to do if something like this happens to us. Um, I don't really have a lot of questions now. I want to turn it over again to um, the sponsor of this hearing to see if she has any questions. Thank you. Um, once again, Councilor Janie, and thank, the, thank you three for being here with us today. I, what you've shared with us has been, um, although I haven't heard the phone number calling the phone number before, <laughs> that's kind of wild. I think that would freak me out a little bit. Um, so I, I, we, during our, um, over the last year when we've gone around to meet with seniors, we've heard all of those stories. And I don't know, um, and it, the one story that we heard that I didn't hear from the three of you, and maybe you've experienced this a little bit with your iPad use, but getting the phone call that we'll, we have noticed a problem with your computer, if you log on, let us help you in accessing the computer that way. Um, and then some of our seniors saying, well, I don't have a computer, and mm -hmm. so it's impossible. But what, what about, what are the, some of the ways that we can encourage seniors who have been victims of scams to come forward that maybe are embarrassed to share um, as, as willingly as you've all shared today? And the follow-up, calling the police or calling the phone numbers to report it or checking in with somebody else to report it, checking in with a friend to ask for advice. How can we support seniors in coming forward with any of the scams they maybe face? Yeah, because that's, it's not easy because a lot of, like you said, a lot of the seniors, they're afraid to come forward if they've been scammed. But in our building, we try to talk to all of the seniors, like we have coffee hour, and at coffee hour, everybody gets together and they say what happened or what didn't happen. And if somebody has a problem, we try to draw it out from them, but it's not easy when they don't want to talk, you know? I can't think of a way, though, to do that. I think the more part of it is the more comfortable we are talking out loud about the phone calls and the challenges and um, the, the easier it might be. Right. Yeah. When we talk about any issue, we yeah. talk about stigma and yeah. Exactly. I would just add that part of it is being comfortable to make sure that there isn't that stigma, that, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. any one of us could easily, um, you know, take that phone call or click right. that button. And it's not your own fault. I mean, it's the, the, the scam artist who's right. taking right. advantage. Right. And so the more that we talk about it, the more that we can help spread the information about what we shouldn't engage in in terms of taking that call or clicking that, that button or cashing that check. Um, but also it helps to kind of spread the information um, because I know I've gotten checks in the mail. My house number has called my house, um, which is freaky and <laughs> scary. It was like the twilight zone. But you know, I know enough not to engage, but there are others who, for whatever reason, it sounds real. Mm -hmm. And so people mm -hmm. kind of engage and we just have to let folks know um, that there, one, if something like this does happen, that there are resources available, and we had the panel right before you who talked about all the wonderful work that they're doing, but also the more that we can just share with each other, you know, other seniors in our network, um, other family members, I think the better off um, we'll be because th these folks are persistent and they know how to go after, and they know how to change it up mm -hmm. and go on to the next scam, as, as we've heard. Yeah. I agree with you. Um, I belong to a group called the Golden Jet Setters at my church. And so the more we talk about these things, the better it becomes, the easier it becomes. Because most of the times we feel isolated and stupid mm -hmm. that we have been taken advantage of and nobody wants to feel that way. And so I think that with, with our group, we try to you know, engage in different things and then sometimes you bring it up you know, casually. And then just to get the conversation going. And I believe that is, as if we do that often enough, that people begin to get comfortable, at least, you know, admitting that they have, you know, had this problem. Because the friend that, that told me about, 
it was quite a while before she even mentioned it to me. And I just happened to say something, and then she got quiet. And then she said, I've never said anything to anyone about this, but this is what happened. You know, it broke my heart, you know? So I'm thinking if, I had, if we had been maybe closer friends or I had a greater, um, I, I guess, Relation, a closer relationship, then maybe we could have done something about it earlier. But because it's a family member, you know, it's very hard. And sometimes we have to have that tough love, mm -hmm. and we're afraid to do the tough love. Right. I you think know. you've been a great friend. The yeah. fact that she felt like she could confide in you um, is, is a testament to that. I think the other thing we have to remember is that these scammers are criminals, and they are doing crime. This is a crime, mm -hmm. and so we should never blame the victim of a crime. It right. is, those are the, the individuals who are doing something wrong. It is not the person who cashed the check or took the call that's doing something wrong. So, um, I'm sorry. Great. No, no I'm, more. I'm good. I really just want to say thank you very much for sharing your experiences and for being here with us today to do that. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very us. much. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. So before we wrap up, I do have to hit this. This is a docket number 0165. This was an order for a hearing regarding elder scamming. Our sponsor here, Councilor Asabi George. I want to thank all of the, the panelists. You guys have been amazing sharing your stories. Our earlier panel, thank you for being here and for all the work that you're doing. This hearing is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.